Hi, this is Todd Oltoff from ToddOltoff.com coming back at you with another screencast. In this week, we're going to take a look at some more of the changes that have been done to both High Sierra and the Server 5.4 application. Now, the reason we're looking at both of those together is there have been a number of uh, services that have been moved out of the server application and into the main operating system itself. And so that's why we're combining those two together into one screencast uh, because they've been moved. And so those of you that have been looking for uh, a few of the services that are no longer available, that's because they're now a part of the main operating system. So we're going to talk about one of those today. Uh, if you remember last uh, screencast, I talked about the Time Machine service, which was moved out of uh, the server application and into uh, the main High Sierra operating system. So that now is available to everyone to be able to do network time machine backups. And today we're going to cover another one of those services, and that is the caching service. Uh, those of you that have been looking for it, you come into the server application, it's no longer here in the sidebar, and that's because this too has been moved into the main uh, system preferences of High Sierra. So I'm going to put down the server application and show you this change. So if we come into system preferences here, we're going to go to the sharing tab. Now everything is pretty much moved into this tab. Anything that's changed from the server application is moved in here. Here. So if I just uh, click on that, you'll notice down here I have the addition of content caching now added right here into the sharing pane of system preferences. And so what I'm going to do is walk through how to set this up and also some hidden features that aren't obvious right away so that you know how to get at them. Uh, now, the content caching service is designed to uh, help you reduce bandwidth and save bandwidth because what it does is it sets up a server or a space, let's say, on your hard drive or an external drive where you will download your different updates, things from the App Store or update software updates that you do. Instead of having to have each individual computer download those over and over again, one machine downloads it, the server keeps a copy of that download, and then all of your other devices update update from that download as opposed to having to re-download everything from Apple servers again. So if you have limited bandwidth and you don't want to uh, use that up with all of these updates, then that's a great way to handle it, especially if you've got a lot of Macs and iOS devices uh, in your home or at your business especially. Uh, this makes it very efficient for you to be able to have, the, have those downloads happen. The beauty of it is, is it's a zero setup type of a thing. And what that means is that uh, your devices will automatically look for a caching server first before they go to Apple servers. So you don't have to do anything on your devices themselves to configure them to look for the caching server on your network. So it really is a great service because it's a set it and almost forget it kind of a thing. So here we are in system preferences. And so let's take a look at this content uh, caching. So all I'd have to do to activate it is to uh, check this box right here to turn it on. Now you can see right now it shows that it's off and I've got two options here. I can choose to cache iCloud content. And so that's iCloud data, such as your photos and documents and stuff like that, that you would cache that information on your computer. Now this can be good and this can be bad. Uh, you know, if you already have a machine where you download everything to it, and so you have all of your uh, hard files, let's say, on that one machine, uh, then maybe you probably don't need to check this box. If, if you don't and you'd like to have everything in one place, then you can check that box. And then every time you download something, it's going to cache a version of it in the caching server so that, again, all of your devices on the network don't re-download those things from iCloud. So that's in the case where you're, let's say, sharing iCloud with a number of people and, uh, and, and that sort of thing, and you're not storing all of your documents on your machine, you're storing them in iCloud, uh, then that's how you would use that and it would save you bandwidth. So again, it all depends on how you have your setup going to, as to whether you want to use this or not. Just be aware that it's going to store all of that data somewhere and so it's going to take up a lot of hard drive space. So it's really up to you. Uh, then you have this option to share uh, internet um, connection here. And so that's where you're sharing the computer's internet connection and cache content with iOS devices connected using USB. And so that's if you uh, have those devices con uh, connected USB, you could use share internet connection for that to happen. So you can check that box right there. Now, we also have this options area down here, and if I just click on this options area, I get this drop down where I can choose where I want to store the cache. And so I can choose to store it on my main drive, or if I just hit edit, it gives me access to all of my other drives, and I may want to store it uh, something like this maybe where I'm going to store it in a uh, bigger storage cache or a bigger drive so that I can have that information stored there. 
The other thing I can do is uh, right here is I'll see what storage is used. So it gives me a way to check how much is actually on the drive, how much has it downloaded. It gives me an idea to know whether or not it's actually working or not by taking a look to see if I'm starting to see megabytes, gigabytes show up here in the storage used. And then I've got this cache size where I can choose from unlimited to driving it down to, you can see I've got a lot of space on this drive, uh, driving it all the way down to a, a more manageable uh, level of cache. You know, maybe I want to take this thing and I can go like this and maybe I say I only want to have let's say 500 gigabytes or 300 or 400 whatever it is of storage and then I would say okay and then I would save that and that would save my information. I'm just going to cancel it for our purposes right here. Now you look at that and you say, wow, that's really simple. Doesn't seem to give me a lot of other customization options. Like what about if I've got multiple caching servers on a network? Cause you can set it up that way uh, where you have either a fallback or you've got them working in tandem. You know, how do I determine who gets access and who doesn't get access if I want to uh, limit it and, and that sort of a thing. Well, there are advanced options in here that are just hidden. If you go to your keyboard and you hold down the actual alt key, or option. Notice that that options area turns into advanced options. You can see how that actually changes right there. And so with, with the key held down, if I just click on advanced options, all of a sudden I've got a few extra things that have been added. I've got tabs now added to the storage area. You can see that this looks the same as, as, as we just went over with the storage information. But now I've got this clients, peers, and parents area. And this is where I can do some of the customization that I could have done in server that was missing from the uh, server app here, or actually the system preferences app. So if I just click on clients here, you'll notice that I've got some uh, options here for clients. Now the clients tab allows you to configure which computers can class themselves as clients for the caching server and are actually permitted to use and store the data here. So there, that's how you would determine that. So this is how you would determine those class. And so I can say uh, cache content for uh, devices used uh, using the same local networks. So those are when we're on the same local network, that's who I want to cache for. Or if I drop this down, I've got a few other options. I can choose devices using the same public IP address so that if I've got multiple subnets or networks, it's just based on the public IP address, not on a specific subnet that I'm on locally. Uh, devices using custom local networks that I set up, so I would limit it to specific networks. Or devices using custom networks with fallback, and that's where I've got a fallback back server that just in case uh, I can't get access to the one server, I've got another one that I can access for cache content. So I can choose how I want that set up. And then down below, I say my local networks use either one public IP address or a custom public, I, uh, custom pu public IP addresses. And so if I chose one of these, then I get this area here where I put the start IP address and the end IP address so that I'm limiting it down by IP address and then DNS configuration as well is set up here. And so that's where you can see some of the server stuff coming into play here. Uh, interestingly enough here, I just would go and change it to whatever I want, okay? So uh, let's just go ahead and put this back to one IP address. Then I've got the peers area here, and the peers tab is similar to the clients tab, but this tab is about sharing cache between other servers instead of clients. So that what's happening is, is I'm setting up IP uh, uh, address ranges to share content with. And so you can see here, I can share content with content caches using the same local networks, or again, using the same public IP address or custom local networks. And so again, that's where I've got, uh, you know, different clients that get to get to say that they're caching servers, okay? And then the final tab we have here is the parents tab. And what this does is this allows me to uh, set up a hierarchy of servers inside a network or across a network where uh, content is cached among these servers and then I can set up the order or the way in which people address those different servers to pull the cache content down. So what I would do is put IP addresses in here and all these IP address ranges and I want to make sure I put them in a particular order, uh, whatever order I want because I'm going to use that when it comes to what I uh, select down here for the parent policy for how to access these different caching servers. So the first parent policy here here is round robin. And so what round robin will do is it will cycle through these different parent IP addresses one at a time until it finds a server it can connect to and then it connects to that one. So the order is very important with the round robin setting. But I've got these other settings available as well. So I've got this first available. And so what it's going to do is the IPs are tried 
uh, again in order uh, until the server is found. Okay, so it's it's going to uh, just try them in order, find the first server available, and whatever's available, it's going to connect to it. Okay, instead of just cycling through it, it's just looking for what's open. I have random, and that's uh, again, I, it will just randomly pick uh, a caching server by its own choice uh, for each request, and that doesn't have anything to do with any order to it. It's just going to pick one. And then I've got sticky available, and what sticky available is is that the, the, I, it still uses the first available option, but once I've connected to one of those caching servers, I'm going to try that one again and just stick to that one unless it's unavailable. So if I hit the third one in the order up here, then I'm going to go back to the third one and just stick to that one until something changes where I can't connect or get through to it. Uh, so that's another way. And then hash down below is what happens is, is that is that the path of the URL that was accessed to down to do the download or the update is captured. And then what happens is is that is that that hash then is remembered and anybody who tries to do that download is now going to go to the same location to get that particular download as opposed to going across different servers. So it's almost like it ties an address to that particular download so it goes back to that particular space. So as you can see, there's a lot of things that I can do in here to customize the caching service. It's added a few more things even than were available in the previous server version, uh, but it really makes it, uh, you know, makes it a lot better. And this was a hidden advanced options area that wasn't known by too many people because it's not obvious at the first uh, first glance. So that's the uh, new caching service uh, inside of uh, High Sierra. Again, moved out of macOS server into High Sierra, and it's now called Content Caching right here in System Preferences under the Sharing pane. Now I'm going to continue to do more of these screencasts uh, to help you understand how to use macOS Server and High Sierra. So if you're interested in that content and when it's delivered, I typically put these out every Friday. And if you'd like, uh, subscribe to my channel uh, so that you get updates on when these things are happening. There's even a little alert button there that will alert you when something new uh, has come up so that you don't have to hunt for it. And that would really help me out with the channel as well. So that's all I have for this week. I'll be back at you next week with another screencast to help you learn how to do more things with your Mac. If you're interested in help in setting up your own server, feel free to contact me at todd at toddoltoff.com.